brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. Cardinal Mueller issued a statement a couple of days ago in a German news outlet that was only really seen by those Catholics in Germany, but it is about something that we all seem to care about to some degree or another, and that is the conflict dominating the news headlines and having such an impact on our everyday lives, or so we're told anyway, by our secular leaders. And regardless of what you may think of that, of the nuances in that topic itself, Cardinal Mueller here gives us an important reminder that throughout history, the popes of the church have always str strived for peace and to settle these conflicts before they got out of hand. And I think it's a good reminder for us today, especially in this Easter season, that as we look upon the cross of our Lord and, and think upon his resurrection in, the, in this glorious liturgical season, that these events that we see happening in the world around us are not to be forgotten and should not necessarily be something we should go all in on on any kind of side, for we are seeing the battle of princes and principalities play out before us. Again, regardless of what people may think about the nuances of things, and I have my own opinions on that, and I keep them to myself, generally speaking. But Cardinal Mueller's letter here is interesting, to say the least, and it gives us a lot of insight into some good Catholic history on these things. So, without further ado, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. Beyond the complex context of contemporary history, the attempt on the life of Pope Boniface VIII at Anagni on September 7, 1303, has a symbolic meaning. In principle, it is about the relationship between spiritual authority and secular power, or, as we would say today, the relationship between religion and politics. Specifically, we are dealing with the tension between conscience, in which we are responsible for God, and political power, which is geared towards temporal interests. Depending on one's ideological point of view, the slap in the face that Schiare Colonna is said to have given the Pope is, regre is regretted as the beginning of the end of the medieval position of power of the Pope, or celebrated as the rise of the secular state, which enjoyed its autonomy over natural moral law and even over the declared religious freedom. However, Western history since then has badly wronged the theory of the absolute state sovereignty, the supranational authority of the papacy had instilled in the Christian states that had emerged from inheritance of the Roman Empire a sense of their unity and responsibility before God. In contrast, the concept of the balance of power could not prevent the catastrophes of the dynastic succession wars in the 18th century, the colonialist revolutionary and liberation wars in the 19th century, and the two imperialist world wars in the 20th century. In many countries, the church itself was both a victim and a promoter of unbridled nationalism and ideological expansionism, allowing itself to be instrumentalized for reasons of state. Just think of Gallicanism, Febronianism, or the foolish propaganda trying to frame, reframe World War I as a final battle between French Catholicism and German Protestantism. And we Christians today are rightly shocked by the infamous interpretation of the war of aggression that we are witnessing on the world stage today being done in the name of religions. The conflicts in the Middle Ages between emperor and pope were not in principle about secular power claimed by the popes, but about asserting the primacy of morality over politics. The love for one's neighbor and the solidarity of the peoples are above the interests of national power, imperial influence, and very flatly materialistic oil deposits and gas supplies. Under the completely changed social conditions and the cultural shifts of modern times, the popes have convincingly performed their role as mediators of peace and as guardians of the natural moral law in the field of international politics. If the politicians of the Entente and the central powers caught in the blind world to power during the First World War had accepted the peace initiative of Pope Benedict XV and agreed upon it, millions of people would not have lost their lives and health pointlessly. In the Bolshevik and other uh, authoritarian forces would not have had the chance to plunge the peoples into an ever greater catastrophe in World War II. On August 24, 1939, Pope Pius XII in a radio speech stated that nothing is lost with peace, but everything will be lost with war. In his unforgettable encyclical Pacem in Terras, Pope John XXIII declared that God is the foundation of the moral order and the guarantor of the development of peoples towards peace and a prosperous coexistence. 
and John Paul II was right in his warning to the Americans about the Gulf Wars, because the destruction of human life and property far exceeds these successes in the fight against interna uh, international fear. And Pope Francis is now right with his warning to one of the countries in the current conflict about the war of annihilation they are waging. Apart from justifying the the activities with mendacious claim to rid the neighboring country of of figures of a bygone era and oligarchs, the loss of human life and the damage to one's own country and all peoples of Europe and the world only confirms the word of Jesus that all who take up the sword perish by the sword. See Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. So from our historical starting point, we have arrived in the middle of the oppressive present in which we must seriously once again raise the question of the relationship between morality and politics. A policy without the religious moral orientation towards a human transcendent dimension or towards the personal God leads mankind into the abyss of military self-destruction or to the death of boredom in a materialistic consumer paradise on earth. What good is it if environmentalists prevent the polar bears from becoming extinct in Greenland, but at the same time the, the most vulnerable are denied the elementary right to exist? The liberal and socialist narrative of the church and the popes always lagging behind the achievements of modern times because they mourned the loss of their secular power in the Middle Ages is wrong, as is Hegel's juxtaposition of Protestantism as the religion of liberty and Catholicism as the religion of bondage. For the alternative to the Catholic understanding of the state, whose authority based on natural law is limited to the temporal bonum commune, is the deification of the state, which Hegel saw already realized in the Prussian state. In root practice, we experience the terrible consequences of this extravagant speculation. If the popes were skeptical about the declaration of the rights of man and citizen at the beginning of the French Revolution, it leads, despite all historical breaks and human failures, to a unified line of church teaching from Peter to Pope Francis. The fundamental law of the history of the world, which is above all and sustains all, consists in the truth that God created man in his image and likeness, with a consequent succession of generations until the last judgment and eternal life and the vision of God face to face. The papacy has survived the attempt on Anagni, as well as all previous persecutions and subsequent trials by the rulers of the world. For in the person of the Pope, the promise of the Son of God of indestructibility and infallibility of the Church is visible and sustainable like a rock in the surf of tides. The Church is convinced that the mystery of man is truly elucidated only in the light of the Word made flesh. See Vatican II document Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 22. Because the Church is not just any human organized self -organ relief organization, or an NGO, but Quote, in Christ the sacrament of the salvation of the world, Vatican II is at the beginning of the pastoral constitution, the church in the world, was able to define in principle the relationship between spiritual authority and temporal power in today's terminology thus, quote, The Holy Synod therefore confesses the high. It declares that something like a divine seed is implanted in him and offers to humanity the sincere collaboration of the church for the establishment of the fraternal communion of all which corresponds to this vocation. In this, no earthly will to power determines the church, but only this one thing, to carry on under the guidance of the Spirit, the Comforter, the work of Christ himself, who came into the world to bear witness to the truth, to save, not to judge, to serve, not to be served. See Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 3. The relationship of the Catholic Church to modern states is mediated by building a culture of peace and a culture of life, as Pope John Paul II said. It begins with respect for the dignity of every human being as a person from conception to natural death and finds its culmination in our calling to the liberty and glory of the children of God. Signed, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, former uh, Archbishop of the Diocese of Regensburg, issued on the 23rd of April, 2022. Curious what you thought of that. Is the work Francis doing now in this regard akin to the popes he compared him to in the past? Is the work he's doing orders of magnitude different because of Francis's own ties to the, you know, what I call the Leviathan, you know, the oligarchs and things that Cardinal Mueller here is in his own letter even decries? Because if, I mean, if it's not different, if, I mean, if there is a difference, if Francis's work here is just orders of magnitude different because of his own ties to these things that have been part of the central cause of what we see going on, 
then I wonder if Mueller is off base here or if he is correct. So I'm curious what you think about this. If he is correct in his assessment here in, you know, essentially lumping Francis in with Pius XII and his predecessors, or if we're saying just something categorically different, not because of the nuances of what's dominating the headlines, but because of what, you know, Francis himself. So let me know what you thought about this in the comments, please, because, again, I'm curious about your take on this. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.